Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Alrighty, folks, today we are visiting with Luke Kovarik, and I've had his wife Natalie on the show before. Um, if you don't follow Natalie on social media, I definitely recommend going and checking her out. Um, she has a podcast, Discover Ag, but then she also has her Instagram page as well, where she's sharing a lot of great information about agriculture and industry news. But today we get to visit with her husband, Luke, and their story is just very powerful and unique. Luke and Natalie both come from ag backgrounds, but they are first generation ranchers. They have started their own operation in Ord, Nebraska, and they're really doing a lot of different things, whether it's cow-calf, backgrounding stalkers, custom AI, gosh, I got to look at the list, heifer development, and they've got a seed stock side of the place too. So they really are doing a lot. And Luke joins me for this conversation to talk about how he manages all that. And specifically, we're going to talk about the ag technology side. And he really heavily uses performance beef along with a lot of other technologies. So we're going to talk about how he got started, um, how Natalie fits into that as well, and really what their operation looks like and how technology has helped them get to where they are today and manage everything that they have going on. So as we dive into that, I do want to remind you to rate and review the show. Let me know what you think. You can do that on your favorite listening app. You can do it on Facebook, um, wherever you want to do a rating and review. And that helps me out. Do that for your other favorite podcast too. That helps them out. And uh, we really appreciate it. That's one of the best ways you can support us. So with that, let's visit with Luke. Well, Luke, good morning. And even if listeners aren't listening in the morning, I know it's uh, not not too early in the morning, but uh, early enough. And I'm glad to have you on the show. I know I've been able, had the pleasure of visiting with your wife on the podcast before and get to follow your guys' journey on social media. But I'm excited to talk about what you guys are doing on your operation and talk about ag technology too. So thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh... I, uh, I enjoy these conversations, even though I don't get to have them very often, and it's typically my wife, but um, it's kind of fun to chime in every once in a while. So, Yeah, absolutely. So, And it, it's always nice to get a different perspective, because each person in the couple kind of has a different perspective, a slightly different role. So we get to hear different sides of the stories. You really get the complete picture. So, Yep, yep, I agree. So with that, talking about the complete picture, I guess... For those listeners who maybe aren't familiar with who you are or have never heard your story before, can you kind of give a little bit of a background and briefly describe, if you can briefly describe everything that you've got going on today <laughs> from your operation? So let's start with where you're at today. And then after that, I'll ask you a few questions about kind of your journey, your journey getting started. So where are you sure. at today? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I guess we call it Kavoric Cattle Company. Um, I don't have a specific breed, so it's not Kavoric Angus or Kavoric Hereford or anything like that. And we're located in Ord, Nebraska. It's just in the uh, very center of the state, about 70 miles north of I-80. And it's a diverse operation. Um, maybe too diverse um, at times, but it's uh, we have a cow-calf, a commercial cow-calf operation. Um we have a backgrounding operation, custom backgrounding. We background our own calves. We run uh, some some cattle on grass as well, yearlings on grass. Um, I'm a area uh, semen salesman for Gen X, so we do custom AI. We do heifer development. And then in the last 10 years, I've started a registered Angus operation. I actually have a few registered Hereford cows as well. Um, and this year, we'll be having our first uh, live auction um, at the ranch, um, selling about just shy of 40, just shy of 40 Angus bulls. And that's kind of on a trajectory to keep, to keep growing. Um, so like I said, there is, uh, it's, it's pretty diverse and maybe too diverse. Um, but that's, that's where we are today. Okay. So let me make sure I got that right. Cow calf, backgrounding, stalkers, custom AI, heifer development, and then the seed stock. That's too. correct. That's correct. Yep. Do you do any farming too, or do you buy uh, all your own feed? 
Um, no, we, we have, um, a little bit of farm ground. I do have it. Um, Oh, I have my neighbor come bail it basically and, and put it up. I mean, we do the irrigating on the, on the hayland and, and move the bales and we'll help. We'll help. Uh, I just don't have the equipment. And, um, sometimes I have to go AI and I can't bail hay that day, you know? And so we used to do it and it was just, uh, they just overlapped too much and it wasn't doing a good job. So, uh, we went away from actually, uh, running the tractors on the, on the hay ground, but, um, that's the extent of our farming. So I'm a, I'm a terrible farmer. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't like it. Uh, I can be covered in commoner after AI and I'm totally happy. And if I get speck of grease on me, I'm just infuriated. So it's, uh, it's just not for me. I, uh, I know quite a few people like that actually. And, uh, yep. I, I see a lot more people, the more I visit with going away from putting up their own hay because of the same purpose, either they don't have time, they can find someone else to do it cheaper. So it's whatever works for you. Yeah. And, uh, I have, um, there's a lot of people around me that are much better at it than I am. And it's mm -hmm. like, just let them, let them do their talents and I'll do mine. And, and, uh, that's been, it's been working out. I, I mean, I don't see myself going back. So, yeah, well, so with that, with all those different segments, everything you have going on, where did you start? Did you come into an existing family operation? Do you have a background in ranching? Where did you and Natalie kind of start? Or maybe you started before you and Natalie were married. What did that look like? Yeah. So um, we call it a first generation uh, operation. Um, I've been, I have been in ranching or around ranching my entire life. Uh, my mom's uh, family uh, she has two siblings and that was the ranch is about 15 miles away that I spent most of my childhood working on or my, you know, teenage years working on my grandpa's ranch. Um, I have cousins and uncles that are on that place. And so there really wasn't an opportunity uh, to join that, um, to join that ranch. My dad's um, family, my dad was an only child and his, his parents, I mean, they were, went through the great depression and, and uh, they were, old uh they were old when my dad was born so they were they were kind of a different generation they had a quarter of, of ground 160 acres with about oh say 40 acres of dry land farm ground and that was it and they had milk cows and they had pigs and they had chickens and they had a few beef cows and and a little bit of dry land farmland and and that was it and um so that was that was the operation that my dad had and he grew up uh just not enjoying farming and ranching and, and not really liking it. And so he uh, left and became an optometrist. And then as uh, us kids were, I have two older siblings, as we were being raised, he wanted us to have stuff to do on the, on the ranch. And so he always had about 50 to a hundred cows and um, he got sick in his fifties and um, sold the cows. And I was in college at that point. And so there was still kind of a little bit of a land base there to operate out of, but but not a, not an operation. So I attended, uh, university of Nebraska at Lincoln, did my undergrad work there. And then I stayed and did a master's in ruminant nutrition with uh, Rick Grasby and Galen Erickson. And, you know, kind of through that, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, I wanted to ultimately ranch, but I just didn't think there was the opportunity. So I thought, well, I'll work in the industry. At least I'll be working with cattle and, and see what the next 20 or 30 years bring. And while in graduate school, um, our neighboring ranch uh, came available to lease along with the cows. And so it's like 200 cows and I was in Lincoln, you know, three hours away. And I thought, well, I better do it. So I started uh, leasing cows when I was in grad school. And at the same time, Gen X was looking for a semen salesman in uh, in central nebraska and so i started that as well and so every weekend we would leave lincoln and either go ai or go take care of cows or um just uh that's how those that's how those two things started and then i graduated in august of 2009 and of course didn't have any money and so i worked at the ethanol plant and sold distillers grains for 10 and a half months and that was the best, worst job ever. Uh, learned a lot, met a lot of people, but uh, definitely something I did not want to make a career out of. So in June of 2010, I, I quit um, at the ethanol plant and 
needed cash flow. So uh, that's when I started backgrounding calves. And so at that point I had a lease commercial cows and, and backgrounded calves and had the Gen X business. And then just as I went forward, uh, more land uh, became available from neighbors uh, to lease. And we actually were able to purchase a place that was fairly close. And then the operation just kind of started, started to grow from there. So I think I currently have 12 uh, landlords that I work with. Um, every one of them is different and unique and uh, has their own um, way they like things done, you know, and you have to just say, I'm on this guy's place today. We're doing it this way. I'm on this guy's place today. We're doing it this way. And um, that's, that's a challenge, but there was really no other way uh, without an existing operation, you know, for me to, to produce. So, um, so by default, that's kind of how I got so diverse. Uh, I needed, I needed the income from AI. I needed the income from backgrounding and heifer development was a logical salute, you know, a logical fit with backgrounding and, and AI business. And I love cows. Um, so I grew, so I grew the cow herd and, um, and I really like seed stock and, and, um, as I just was able to, I, I've been growing the, the seed stock side of things. So, so is it fair to say that your intent for diversifying came for kind of a risk management approach to needing cash flow? Absolutely. Yep. And same thing with the stockers. That's why we run stockers is also a, uh, just a drought, just a drought plan. You know, if, if 25 to 30% of our forage is allocated to stockers and we're in a drought, then we can liquidate those. So, uh, and I think I'll keep that diversity. I really like that. Some of the other diversity, you know, I'm wrestling with, do I need to custom background calves or do I need to uh, do so much custom AI? And I mean, Natalie and I, so I started that and I came back in 2009. Natalie and I got married in 2017. Um, we have three boys now, you know, I mean, life is just a lot different than it was when I started and, and did all of those, did all of those things. So, you know, I'm a creature of habit though. I have a hard time, you know, someone calls and wants me to feed a plant of calves. I have a hard time saying no, you know, and, but I, I'm wrestling with that. And I, th I think I know which way I need to change, um, but I just haven't been able to do it. Yeah. So before we dive into the technology side and how you implement technology on, on your operation with as diverse as you are, let's touch a little bit about who's involved on your operation. So, you know, what's Natalie's role? Um, I know she has a huge social media presence. She's helping other businesses. She has her own Discover Egg podcast. Like what is her role on the operation and how does her career complement what you're doing today? Yeah. So, um, Nat Natalie's very busy with, um, all of the things that she, uh, does. And so it's, it's, uh, she's, I mean, she's willing to help, you know, kind of anywhere, uh, we need her whenever we need her. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say that she has like a set role because of all of the other things that she is involved in. So it's basically what's your schedule. Okay. We're going to work cattle at this time, or we're going to drive cattle, move cattle here. Or could you drive a pickup here? And so that would be, you know, Natalie's role from a, from a day-to-day -day basis. And then, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that really put myself out there or, or, or talk about, you know, the operation or our cattle or this or that. And she has really um, helped me uh, talk about our cattle, talk about what we're doing, especially on the seed stock side of things. Um, it's just not my nature, but it needs to be it's important. It needs to be done. And we've had a lot of success. I've just met a lot of people, which I really enjoy. And we've done that through Natalie's social media and um, her knowledge of that and her, you know, her own accounts. So um, that's been, been really helpful. Do you have other employees that work with you? Yeah. Yep. We have two, um, two other employees. Um, one has been with me for over four years and then He's about 25, I think. Yeah, he's 25. And then we have a 21-year-old. And he interned for us from uh, Lincoln uh, two summers ago. And he was just a, a great intern, a great a great kid. And he has a his interests lie in the seed stock side of things. And he graduated in May of this past year. And we um, offered him a full-time job. And, and he came on. So um, I'm very blessed with uh, the employees, I can, I can be gone and it, 
probably gets done better than if I was there, honestly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they're, they're great. Yep. Let's yep. say there's a lot of people who wish they could have that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it can be a challenge to find the right person, go through that training period with them to make them the right person for the job. Um, and yeah, so that's good that you have that. Yep. I agree. And we, I mean, we give our employees opportunities. Um, they can run cattle. Uh, sometimes if ground comes up and I'm going to lease it, I'll partner with an employee on the set of heifers we develop or things like that. So I, I don't know. I've, I have very good help. I found really good help. I found good young help. People say young kids don't want to work, but I don't see that. Um, and like I said, I just give them, I just give them opportunities to produce and, and they love that. And then they can make extra money or if it doesn't work and it break even, they'll break even, but they got a shot, you know? And so, uh, that's been, that's been good for us and been good for, for them as well. So. Awesome. So when you think about your journey and beginning to diversify and add different segments to your operation, at what point did you start leaning on different tools, especially like the technology form to make things more efficient for you? Um, when the background in operation, you know, started growing, uh, I first just backgrounded say 500 calves for one guy. And then as we started um, getting more customers and feeding more cattle and uh, feed costs increase, all of those things, um, accuracy and the backgrounding phase was just it, it was extremely important. And I started with performance beef, I want to say in 2017 or 18, using it, maybe 18 or 19. Anyway, you know, at that point, um, or a small background in operation, but you're still handling, you know, millions of dollars worth of feed, uh, all of the interest, all of the shrinks and billing, you know, multiple different customers. And I mean, it was a nightmare from an Excel, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet standpoint and a notebook in the payloader and the feed calls and the rations and all of that. And uh, when we implemented performance beef, it just simplified all of that. And um, honestly, I feel with just the accuracy of, of the scales and the loading and the shrinks, you know, performance beef more than pays for, um, pays for itself, pays for the convenience. Um, and then, you know, we were just visiting about, I have two employees. Well, each one of them have performance beef on their cell phone. So everybody can, if, we, if we're moving cattle, if we're sorting cattle, if we're, we have a dead or any of those kinds of things, all of that is updated. Uh, each person can do it from their pocket. And then when I sit down in the office to do my work, it's all, it's all right there. And I just, even if I, even if I got rid of the background in operation, I would still keep performance beef just for my own cow herd and my own use, because uh, it's just such a great tool. So a little bit more on performance beef itself. It allows you to track break evens on a set of calves, right? You said feed inventory, cattle inventory, or maybe is it both all, of those all, correct? All of that? All, all of the above. Yep. Yep. And cattle inventories by, by pin, by ownership. Um, and then I just really like the history. So, you know, we've been running stalkers for several years now, and I just feel so comfortable going into my performance and saying, these are the calves that I bought last year. This is the ration I fed them last year. This is what they gained when they went to grass. This is what they gained here. You know, I mean, I could, ju I just feel so comfortable with with my projections. I mean, you can do a projection, but what's it worth if, if you don't have any data, you know, I mean, oh, they're going to gain this. Well, did they, you know, and what is it really going to cost? And so, um, yeah, you can use all of those, um, those tools and then you can do a close that at the end and, and you know, exactly, exactly where you were and, and, uh, how it worked, you know, and, and uh, then it helps you make decisions for the next time. And I also feel, you know, my customers ask me, what's it going to cost? What are they going to gain? And I, I know how it works on my place now versus just a nutritionist that gives you a ration and says, this should do this. Well, I, I feel very comfortable because we have, we have all that data just from our little, you know, our little background in yard. If you're a major feed yard, obviously you have that, but um, a lot of independent, smaller producers or medium sized producers don't have that available, but performance, performance gives you that. Are you able to tie that into any, anything on the genomic side or DNA side? for calves? Cause I know that's kind of 
a rising thing too with different companies is even testing steers that are going to be fed out genomically or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely, I mean, performance would have the ability to, to do that. You could take your DNA, take your genomics, uh, have an EID tag that links that calf to that and then record performance, um, you know, through a feeding period and, and tie that back to that animal. Uh, we do that with our registered um, herd. I mean, there's a phase where we grow calves from weaning to yearling weight, and that's tied to an individual ID. Um, so yeah, performance would help you, would help you with that. Um, or it, it can be integrated, you know, into, into performance ranch or even just the, the shoot side app that, that we use sometimes. So um, yeah, the possibilities are really endless with performance and what you can, what you can do. Outside of performance beef, are there other technologies that you're using on your operation? I mean, AI, I'm assuming that's an obvious one. Um, AI. You just talked about EIDs. Um, yeah, we do embryo um, transfer. We do a lot of embryo yeah. transfer. Uh, we do genomic all of our registered cattle. Um, even though, you know, my, my goal is not extremes. I feel like people, genomics kind of get a bad rap sometimes because people feel like uh, genomics are meant to find the freaks and the extreme cattle and that people just select off genomics. And that's true in some cases, um, but it's not always true. And we use genomics just to, I mean, we, we don't want extreme cattle in really any manner, um, except for good. <laughs> and there's not a genomic test for that. Um, but, but you could still use genomics to, to uh, just not make, not make a huge mistake, not go down the road with, with a bull that, that just takes you in the wrong direction, you know? So, um, I feel all those technologies are, are, um, wonderful. And when they're all incorporated together, it's pretty powerful. So there's always an input cost when you're adding a new technology. And especially when you're a first generation producer, such as you, you and Natalie, how did you yep justify that? Was it because you knew there would be an ROI? Did you feel like it was still a gamble when you implemented some of these? What was kind of your thought process behind implementing technology and being progressive right off the bat? Yeah. Um, so from a performance beef standpoint, well, I initially uh, did it just from a, from a time standpoint of recording uh, the feeding and billing customers. Um, I didn't really grasp the, uh, all of the other things that performance was going to uh, provide for me. So that, that was a very easy and quick, um, return on investment and, you know, just, um, uh, made sense right away and, and, uh, has continued to work. You know, some of the other technologies like genomic testing, every single animal, you know, that that's, it's an expense, a pretty good expense, pretty large expense. And, it's probably going to take several years until you really get that until you really get that back. But I just, uh, I still just feel like it's the, it's the right way to go uh, ultimately. And you want to provide as much information as you can provide to the people that are purchasing bulls from you. And I want to know as much information as I can know um, about that heifer uh, when she's a, when she's a calf versus when she's a 10 year old cow. And so I just, once again, I don't, I don't think I'll go away from it. You know, even though sometimes I disagree with it, I say genomics, you're wrong, but, um, that, that doesn't always work. It, that's, it can be, uh, it can be hard when you see this beautiful heifer phenotypically, and then you can look at our numbers and it's like, are you sure? But I mean, right. The science is yeah. there. The science is yeah. there. <laughs> that's why, uh, uh, sometimes I just, you know, yeah, numbers are great, but they don't always, they don't always tell the whole story. And I also caution, you know, people using the indexes when everything is summarized and into a one, into a one number that is represented as a dollar figure, uh, because that may not be the, the situation on your ranch. Obviously that's a, that's a bunch of different numbers put together and they all have different weights and, and they're all worth different amounts in that index. And, and so I, um, yeah, it's a general, it's a general rule, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just go all in on, on that one number. And I think that's where people can get in trouble and, and, uh, go down the wrong road. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a balance and it's uh, understanding, like you said, what you need for your operation. Yep. Yep. I, exactly. Your environment and your operation and, and, um, 
how, how things work best for you. So, so with your use of performance beef, you know, when we look at COVID hitting and then as inputs really seem to increase, how did performance beef help you make sound management decisions on your operation? Well, kind of a two, kind of a two phase uh, answer, I guess, to that question. Just this, the first is, is the increase in interest rates, the increase in feed costs, and then the increase in volume of cattle that we are feeding, um, the, the accuracy of, of performance beef from a, from a feeding standpoint, a shrink standpoint and an interest standpoint is, you know, an, an incredible amount of money that you really don't realize is, is there. And I just had that old, that old kind of crusty rancher feeling like I've been using performance beef for the last year or two. And there's just more money in the backgrounding uh, account than there was in prior years. And where did it come from? Well, it came from all of those things, you know, it, it came from shrink on the high moisture pile to hay shrink to interest in, and uh, overfeeding and keeping track of records. So, um, you know, so that's the one phase. And then the other phase is the backside of it, the data that you get um, from the closeouts, you know, from your operation, and then using that to make better decisions when you're purchasing or when you're going, when you're going forward with the, with the next round of calves or the next set of stockers. And so w- when you combine those two, I mean, it has huge effects. Do you use performance beef with your, I mean, we haven't talked about what your bull development process looks like, but are you tracking your bulls with that too? Just the, just their feed intakes, just their feed inventories. Um, I mean, we're selling 40 bulls, so, um, it's not like it's a, it's a huge cumbersome data set, uh, that we use, uh, performance beef for. So, um, definitely could, and I could see it working for lots of operations. We, we don't, but <laughs> so if you can go back and start over with your whole operation, is there anything you would do differently? Um, yes, I would, I would, I would start the seed stock thing, uh, earlier that operation takes a long time and it's expensive and, and you have to, uh, we've, you know, we've just grown it organically, just grown it within ourselves. And, uh, so yes, I, I feel like it has just been 10 years and we're still only selling 40 bulls and they're, they're the, the ones I like, they're the ones I, I want, uh, but it's just taken a long time to get there. So I would have started that operation earlier. And other than that, no, I really don't. I mean, I wish I would have said I wouldn't, wouldn't have built a background and yard, um, just because I'm kind of wanting to phase out of that. Uh, but there would have been no other way to cash flow my operation and there would have been no other way to live. And so it was a necessity and same thing with leasing, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, I wish I would have bought the ground instead of lease the ground 10 years ago because of where our land prices have went and, and paying rent on something, but it wasn't possible. So for a first generation, um, that's what we had, uh, that's what we had to do and uh, what we still have to do honestly. And, um, Cause there's just not the capital available to, to do, to start and, and have a, um, you know, a large enough scale to be profitable and, and to live. So um, it was just all kind of what we had to, what we had to do to, to produce. So. You really seem like someone who you see an opportunity in the beef industry and you jump at it. Yeah. How, how do you, kind of go about thinking through if it is an opportunity worth jumping into versus stepping back because especially if you're naturally if that's your personality to naturally like jump into an opportunity like sometimes you gotta take a step back and catch yourself so how do you go about that well um i have never um very been very good at saying no and um and I'm working on that. <laughs> I need to, I, I need to say no more. Um, and I need to, uh, not jump into opportunities so quick. Cause if you say, if you say yes to something, you're probably saying no to something else. And, you know, that's sometimes that's family. Sometimes that's, uh, just, you know, just a peace of mind. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. You know, we, 
we did sell um, a set of young cows this year because because cow prices were high and I and I could have kept the cows and my gut is to keep the cows and run more cows and grow. But I also thought we can reduce debt and we can take advantage of these high prices. So that's kind of been the first year that I've done that the first time that I've done that. And I could probably let a couple of leases go that are the furthest away, but I just haven't, I haven't been able to do that one quite yet. So uh, that's just, it's just hard. Cause I never had, you know, I never had a ranch. I never had land. I was always short on land and I always wanted more cows cause I love cows. And uh, so it's just my whole life. It's just been, yes, yes, yes. I'll do it. I'll take it. Yeah, we'll do it. And you know, now I turned 40 this year. So it's like, uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say yes to everything. <laughs> okay. So you seem to have a very business approach, business mindset or approach to what you're doing, but you also just said like, it was hard for you to let go of cows because you love cows and you've always, you know, dreamed about having more cows. So how do you stay focused on that business mindset and keeping in mind that side of the business as opposed to getting rooted in tradition or legacy or just maybe even for you since your first generation, just that desire to just the ranching side of it, just have those cows. Yep. Um, you know, I kind of, uh, so I always, I always expanded when there was an opportunity to expand and I had a neighboring ranch, uh, probably could run 300 cows on it that came available and 2015. And I, I said, yes, I took, I took the opportunity and expanded. And I spent the next eight years trying to, trying to pay off that, uh, that decision as things, as things fell in 16. And, uh, um, there was, you know, several tough years of, of cow calf. And so, you know, just, uh, just, uh, living through that, that, uh, that crash and that cycle and that debt and made, made me business minded and just made me say, you know, it's still gotta be a business. And, um, and then, you know, nine years later, maybe not the high, but, uh, higher markets, um, we're, we're selling cows instead of buying cows. And so, um, I think that just the experience, you know, and, and, uh, going through that and the time, um, just made it, um, and ultimately, ultimately, if you run a good business, you know, in the end, you're probably gonna have more cows and more land than, than you do if you just do everything with emotion all of the time. You know, there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows and, and you have to keep your main cow herd intact, but you also have to take opportunities to take profit and, and take it home. When you got started, did you ever imagine that this is where you and Natalie would be at or that you'd be using this much technology on your operation? I mean, no, I mean, when I, I was in graduate school in, in, uh, 2007 through 2009, and I mean, we didn't have the technology to do research then that, uh, that we have now today for just, just going and feeding calves. So the technology, uh, like performance beef has, has just evolved so much and so rapidly. And, and obviously they're, you know, they're, um, their computer programs and, and how everything works there, but then just the iPads and the data and the internet. And I mean, all of that is, has just given uh, people, you know, so much, so many tools to use anywhere. And then, you know, the size wise, yeah, I just, you know, there's that quote that always floats around on Facebook or whatever. And it just says, remember the day that you wish you were where you are today. You know, I never thought we'd run this many cows or have this big of an operation or sell bulls. Uh, so sometimes I have to just kind of pinch myself and say, yeah, this is what you wanted to do and you're doing it, you know, and, and enjoy it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy how, how fast things can change. So if there's another rancher background or small feeder out there who is wondering if they should dig into performance beef or any other technology, what would you tell them to think through and consider first before making the leap? Um, yeah. So I have, I don't know how many people I have sold performance beef to, but, but a lot. Uh, I was one of the first people in our areas to use it. And it's kind of one of those things. A lot of people said, Oh, do you really need that? You know, do you really need that? You could just 
write it down and this and that. And I don't know a single friend of mine now that doesn't, uh, that doesn't use it. I felt like I was kind of a tech service guy there for a while. When a lot of friends were jumping on performance, they would call me a, a question, you know, I was like, you know, they have an amazing tech support. Like they're really, really good. You can just call, you can just call those guys. <laughs> uh, um, cause they'll answer on Easter cause I've called them on Easter before and, uh, and they did answer. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, I, I just think if you're doing, if you're handling, if you're doing any custom feeding for sure, or you're billing other people, uh, the accuracy of, of performance beef is it's just going to pay. It's just going to pay for itself. And I think it's a, as, as much money as we spend in agriculture on equipment and all of the things, I think performance beef is a, is a really a small investment on the scale and with, with huge returns. All right, Luke, do you have any last words on entrepreneurship, ag technology, or advice for young producers? Any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap up today? Yeah, I mean, I get asked that question a lot. Um, and, you know, I've had to do it through through leasing and through um, uh, leasing land and leasing cattle. Um Leasing land is a lot easier than leasing cattle. Um, I've leased cattle from probably four or five different people. And that's, that's a hard one. That's a hard challenge. So I could see leasing, you know, for a young producer, leasing cows for a little while, but then it's just hard to maintain two people uh, making decisions about one cow herd and making the same decisions and, and, and keeping that, um, that relationship for a long time. So I would say, you know, if you, if you start in that, if you start in that, that's great. It's a great way to start and build cows, but then I would try to buy the cows or, you know, transition somehow out of that fairly quickly and then maintain the relationship with still leasing the ranch. Cause that rancher doesn't have his cows anymore. And so, um, you know, and then you just got to get along with people. Sometimes you just got to swallow your pride and you can totally disagree with, with what they, how they want to do it or, or, how, you know, a variety of things, but, um, you just got to kind of be flexible, valuable and, and, uh, be easy to get along with. And then all those guys talk, all those old guys talk, you know, and, and you get a call from the neighbor and you get a call from the next neighbor and you get a call from the next neighbor. And all of a sudden you got another place put together and it might be four, four different landlords, but you know, you can run 300 cows over there in one spot. So, um, just, uh, yeah, be flexible and always look for, always look for opportunities. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining me today for this conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I enjoy it too. Yeah. It's fun. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.